pleasure to welcome you all to this evening of Kitab, the book launch series where today there shall be the book launch of the book, The Battle of Belonging, written by Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Kitab is an initiative of Prabhakhetan Foundation. Today's launch is in collaboration with the LF Book Company. Prabhakhetan Foundation, instituted in the year 2000, is a registered public charitable trust. As an NGO, the foundation promotes art, culture, education, wildlife conservation, and literature through various events and activities and also spreads awareness about gender equality and women empowerment. We feel that placing culture at the heart of development policy constitutes an essential investment in our country's future. We celebrate cultural diversity in language, music, literature, visual arts, dance, drama, oral traditions, and traditional practices. Prabhaketan Foundation is an innovator of various boutique events to promote literature, writings, art, and culture. From Hindi to Bangla, Punjabi, Marathi, Uriya, Kanna, Telugu, Tamil, Bhojpuri, Urdu, Farsi, we work in these and many more languages that keep the soul of our regional languages, art, and culture alive. Today, for this book launch, we have with us Sri Hamid Ansari Sahab, Honorable Formal Vice President of India, Dr. Farooq Abdullah Sahab, former Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir and Chairman of Jammu and Kashmir National Conference, Mr. Pavan Varma Sahab, author, diplomat, and former member of parliament, the Rajya Sabha, Professor Makaran Paranjape Sahab, who is currently the director at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, Mr. David Davidar, publisher and managing director of Aleph Book Company, and our very own, the author of this book, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. He is the best-selling author of over 20 books both fiction and non-fiction. Besides being a noted critique and columnist, he is the longest serving member of the Lok Sabha from Thiruvananthapuram. I welcome all of you to this beautiful evening. And I'm sure Mr. Karanthapur is going to soon join us. But now may I request uh, Honorable former Vice President Sri Hamid Ansari Sahab to release the book and at the same time, may I request Dr. Farooq Abdullah ji, Mr. Pavan Varma ji, Professor Makaran Paranjapeji, and Mr. David Davidar, along with Dr. Shashi Tharoor ji, to hold up their books too. I have my book too. Thank you very much. You've got it all. It is already launched. <laughs> there it is. The ribbon can be put away and the book is all there for those Thank you. who have not read it. Now, may I request Honorable former Vice President, Mr. Hamid Ansari Sahab to speak a few words. Thank you very much. I can do without titles. Uh, uh, Apra Kuchal ji, Dr. Farooq Sahab, my old colleague, Pavan Varma ji, Professor Pranjpe, Karan, as and when he joins us, Dr. David Davidar, and last but by no means the least, Dr. Shashi Tarus. Where shall I begin? Here is a passionate plea for an ideal of India, an India that was taken for granted by a generation and now is seemingly engendered by overt and covert ideas and ideologies that seek to segment it on imagined criteria of us and them. In a set of over three dozen erudite 
essays, Dr. Shashi Tharoor has dilated on the essential ingredients of Indianness as understood in the freedom struggle and in the subsequent seven decades of the Republic of India. He concludes by urging the youth to revert to the core values of the constitution and to its diversity. I found the essays on identity and patriotism particularly enlightening as also the last section of the book on reclaiming India's soul. Shashi's conclusion that, and I quote him, a Hindu Rashtra will end up dividing India, unquote, is disturbing. His preference for a liberal democratic India rooted in inclusive civic nationalism is clearly to be preferred. The focus of the book is on the core values of Indian polity and on their systematic subvention in recent years. I beg your pardon, sub systematic subversion in recent years at the hands of a political ideology that has gained ascendancy through the political process. Hitherto, our core values were summed up as an existential reality of a plural society, a democratic polity, and a secular state structure. These were accepted in the freedom movement. They were incorporated in the constitution and encapsulated in the preamble of the constitution. The plurality of our society is evident from the sociological evidence of 4,635 communities, 78% of whom are not only linguistic and cultural, but also social categories. Every fifth Indian belongs to a recognized religious minority. The human diversities are both spatial and hierarchical, and they seek recognition. It is this diverse mass that a new ideology is seeking to homogenize supposedly on the basis of a faith premised on an imaginary history. As an ancient land, the diversity and complexity of India and of the historical process was well reflected in Raghupati Rai Firak's Urdu couplet, Sar Zamine Hind Par Afla Ke Alam Ke Firak Karva Ate Gay Hindustan Banta Gaya. We do not know who the original inhabitants of this vast landscape were, who could claim primacy over others. Gulwakarji, of all people, has depicted Iran as the Arya Bhumi to describe the land of the origin of the Aryans. The roots of subsequent arrivals can be similarly traced. None were original. All became ingredients. The pretensions of a common origin and of an original faith have no basis in facts. And yet, in a short space of four years, India has made a very long journey it has traveled from its founding vision of civic nationalism to a new political imagery of cultural nationalism. 
that appears to be firmly embedded in the public realm. I have a set of three questions for which I seek answers. One, why has this happened? Two, why has a plural society with a long tradition of accommodation of diversity reflected in the constitution decided to abandon it in favor of a unilateral and distorted reading of its own past? And thirdly, why is it attempting to rewrite the history of its own freedom struggle and of the values enshrined in it? Observers have attributed the changes underway to four phenomena, populism, authoritarianism, nationalism, and majoritarianism that together create an intoxicating mix together with a slanted reading of the religio-philosophical legacy of the Indian civilization that depicts us as a dharmic people. But does this also lead us to practice intolerance towards fellow citizens and abandon fraternity and social cohesion? That is the question. COVID-19, as we all know, as a pandemic is bad enough. But before it, our society became a victim of two other pandemics, religiosity and strident nationalism. Religiosity is defined as extreme religious ardor, denoting exaggerated embodiment, involvement, or zeal for certain aspects of religious activity enforced through social, even governmental pressure. We know from our reading of history that the founders of faith and religious systems themselves did not exhibit religiosity, nor did they place any right or duty above the basic moral precepts. Dilution or corruption of their teachings came much later and has the handy, is the handiwork of their followers. Much has similarly been written about the perils of strident nationalism. It is been called an ideological poison that has no hesitation in transcending and transgressing individual rights. Record the world over shows that it at times takes the form of hatred as a tonic that inspires vengeance as mass ideology. Some of it is can be witnessed even in our own land. Decades earlier, Ravindranath Tagore had called nationalism great menace describes and he described it as one of the most powerful and aesthetics that man has invented. He had expressed himself against the idolatry of the nation. Similarly, Albert Einstein considered it an infantile disease. As against this, patriotism is a much more positive concept. Dr. Tharoor has written about it. It is defensive, both militarily and culturally. It inspires noble sentiments, 
but must not be allowed to run amok since in that condition it tramples on the very values that the country seeks to defend to overcome this conceptual distortion to which we are being subjected we are in urgent need of proclaiming a new triad <coughs> one religion is not politics <coughs> two religiosity is not religion and three that peace harmony and happiness can emanate only from adherence to principles of justice in human dealings with in human dealings with each other at the individual and the group levels whether they be local groups national groups or international groups this book's analysis is comprehensive yet it stops short of suggesting a doable recipe of correcting the shortfalls we are instead confronted with the vision of coat and coat republic of fear where civic nationalism will be replaced by ethno nationalism and where the new instrumentalities of surveillance and control that have surfaced in the post covid-19 period will be misused as are being misused evidence of this is all too apparent dr taro rightly says and i quote him if india is to reclaim its soul the urgent national challenge is to restore empower and renew the very institutions of civic nationalism that the bjp has commandeered and weakened end of the quote the corrective however lies in the political process the very instrumentality that is in dire need of rejuvenation is this being done in word and deed that is the answer that i and other readers of the book will seek jai hind thank you so very very much thank Amitra. you this guy sorry i forgot to just want to thank you thank you thank you so very much uh, hamid and sai sahab that was wonderful uh, now may i request mr david davidar of lf book company to give his speech thank you um thank you for those illuminating words honorable chief guest um mr hamid ansari um i'm going to be very brief because i'm as anxious as everybody else who's tuned in to listen to our distinguished participants so um i'd like to start by um talking briefly about the subject of the book our nationalism our patriotism and more technical things like citizenship and legal and fundamental rights are bred in the bone or become ours if we can't claim them as our birthright when we become nat naturalized citizens of this great country but what does nationalism actually mean dr hamid ansari uh, told us a bit about it but i mean there is there are many many conflicting definitions and um ideas of nationalism and what about patriotism and is there a right sort of nationalism and a wrong sort of nationalism is the wrong sort of nationalism anti nationalism there are facile and ill informed answers to these questions and in this demotic age with the spread of social media these are in the ascendant anyone can vent to express an opinion without knowing very much about the subject they are being expressive about and when it comes to concepts like nationalism and patriotism that are central to our very lives as indians and sentient beings 
naturally, there is much dangerous nonsense that is being disseminated. This is why I hope every Indian, whether he or she agrees with Dr. Tharoor's point of view or not, reads The Battle of Belonging because it is a remarkably learned and even more importantly, even-handed and lucid study of these foundational ideas, concepts, and national values. It is of crucial importance to define nationalism and patriotism precisely. And over the centuries, many of the world's most aware writers, thinkers, philosophers, statesmen, and scholars have tried to do so. The book looks at all the extent credible theories that have been put out to date to give us a really clear-eyed view of what nationalism and patriotism are, what could be construed as anti-national, fittest, seditious, and so on. As I've said, if every ill-informed commentator would only read this book, I suspect they would be rather shamefaced about the opinions they hold here. I could go on for much longer about all the gifts this book has to give, but I'm going to wind up because, as I said at the outset, I'm anxious to hear from our participants. But I would like to say one final thing. I have been a publisher for over 30 years, in the course of which I've published several thousand books. Some of these have been good, some bad, some mediocre, some great. In a very select category, there were books I would deem essential, books that most people who wish to be ill-informed, intellectually stimulated and fulfilled, would wish to read. Such books naturally are very rare and constitute less than 1% of books that are published around the world every year. When I first read The Battle of Belonging in manuscript, I decided to add another category to my method of cataloging books. This category, which would encompass only the rarest of the rare, would be called indispensable, books that you could not do without. I hope people will be reading and discussing The Battle of Belonging 50 years from now. That's what indispensable books are all about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. David. That was so rightly said. Um, may I request Dr. Farooq Abdullah Sahab to say a few words? I would rather love to hear Shashi first. Why don't I just introduce the book perhaps and then, then we can have a conversation, the rest of us. Sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, Farooq. So I, I gather Karan Thapar is still having difficulties logging in. And so uh, I, was, I was told that before we start the discussion, I should say a few words about the book and I, I thought it might be useful as an introduction. I do want to thank very much uh, my, my, my respected senior friend, uh, former vice president, uh, Shihamid Ansari Sahab for his very gracious and generous words and David for his uh, extraordinarily kind uh, remarks, particularly his closing point. Um, and of course, uh, our very, very distinguished uh, panel. I'm, I'm honored to count each of them as a friend in different contexts of my life. Dr. Farooq Abdullah Sahab, Pawan Varma, Professor Makran Paranjpe, uh, David himself, Apra Kuchal are all people who have come into my life in wonderful ways. And I'm so grateful you decided to join us in discussing this book. Two things at the outset. First, the book is in many ways the culmination of a lifetime's thought, reading, and argument on issues of nationalism and patriotism that, as I explain in the text, are not just theoretical or academic for me, but intensely personal too. I'm going to read the prologue to find out why. Second, when I decided to write it, I actually had a shorter volume in mind, uh, but I felt it would be unwise to write about nationalism without delving deeply into the rather vast scholarly literature that exists on the subject, even though I'm writing for lay people and not for scholars. So I took advantage of the pandemic and the associated lockdowns, uh, not just to read and in many cases reread classic works on nationalism, but for the first time in my writing career of now 22 books, I actually sent my first draft to four scholars I know and respect to seek their learned comments and benefited greatly from their responses. My thanks to them Tabhanu Mehta, Shruti Kapila, Pradeep Chibber, and Manu Pillai, who all contributed their insights into my uh, early hacking away at the subject. So I hope the book, as a result, has a solidity that might ensure it endures as David wants it to. Now, the book was prompted by the rise of a fundamental challenge to the very essence of Indian nationalism. The idea of India, as, as, as uh, Hamid Ansari said, was built up in the course of a seven-decade struggle 
for independence from Britain and another seven decades of post-colonial governance that consolidated the nature and character of independent India. Now the BJP uh, and, and, and the present government for the last six years has spent its years in government contesting the established idea of India by arguing that there can be an alternative idea of India, promoting an assortment of political, social, and cultural elements that would convert a pluralist, multi-religious democracy into a Hindu Rashtra, and in some ways delegitimizing dissent through labeling disagreement with its actions and statements as anti-national. I think all of us today have at one point or the other been accused of that. The frequent use of that term has raised the corollary question, if my disagreement is anti-national, then what is pro-national, what is nationalism? Now, the Battle of Belonging seeks to offer one observer's notes towards an understanding of nationalism in the world, and then specifically in India today. So I take the theory, practice, evolution of the various forms of nationalism in the world, religious, linguistic, cultural, other nationalisms based on various immutable factors, India's own anti-colonial nationalism, that converted itself into a civic nationalism anchored in, in a democratic constitution, and then the conflict over contemporary attempts to convert that into a religious cultural nationalism. So that's the battle of belonging to India and having India belong to you. That is the principal themes. Those are the principal themes of this book. Now, as I write in the book, patriotism and nationalism are different. A patriot is prepared to die for his country, but a nationalist is ready to kill for his state. And that is an important distinction because to my mind, patriotism is about loving your country simply because it is yours, because you belong to it and it belongs to you <clears throat> the way you would love your mother without claiming she is perfect. <clears throat> Whereas the Hindutva <laughs> movement promotes identity as the basis for Indian nationhood as an identity anchored around a religious community and animated by the memorable slogan, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. I argue in the book that we must continue to fight against this idea of ethno-religious nationalism and assert that love and inclusivity remain at the heart of what it means to be a true patriot. Whereas the nationalism being promoted in India today is a totalizing vision that excludes those who don't subscribe to it, that demands allegiance and brooks no dissent. Yes, as others have said, I believe in civic nationalism and nationalism anchored not in identity, not in these immutable markers that you're born into, like your religion, your language, your ethnicity, and so on, but anchored in constitutions and institutions where all citizens are treated equally, irrespective of identity, and their differences are accepted and respected. So that's the nationalism I argue for in the book. Civic nationalism, of course, derives from the consent of citizens to participate in a free and democratic society. It's based around the core tenets of representative democracy, freedom of expression, constitutionalism, liberal democratic institutions, and emerges from a crucial voluntary participation in civic society. That's the sort of nationalism guaranteed by our constitution. And you know, the uh, representative democracy and the liberal institutions of our, of our state and our nation have been outlined in the constitution. So I argue in my book that it's crucial that this brand of civic nationalism, which best safeguards individual rights, has to be promoted and protected above all others. Now, patriotic nationalism is what inspired the long struggle for independence uh, with a manner of thinking rooted in India's time-honored civilizational traditions. I know it's often flung at me the line by some of my critics that India didn't start in 1947. We go back thousands of years and they're right. But these time-honored civilizational traditions as I read them are of inclusivity, of social justice, of religious acceptance, of pluralism and the desire to forge a society that allowed individuals to flourish without barriers thrown up from birth. And this has been distorted as, as uh, Sansari very memorably said, uh, 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 a unilateral and disputed and distorted version of its own past. He says, and that's what we're seeing thrown at us today. And it's, it's as a result, exclusionary, aggressive and sectarian uh, versions of nationalism that the Hindutva movement is promoting. Now, I would argue that the battle is not over. Uh, Hamid Vai suggested that I've not found any solutions. Very true. But the fact is that the many Indians are engaged in this battle to reclaim the inclusive view of nationalism and patriotism I describe in the book, which stands in total opposition to a political mindset that seeks to exclude people based on any immutable aspect 
of their identity. The ethno-religious nationalism of Hindutva would end up denying India to many Indians. And that's a situation that no patriot could ever accept. So to summarize, my objective was to situate the passions currently swirling in Indian politics in the wider context of the basic concepts of nationalism and patriotism, then apply those to the Indian experience and the contemporary Indian reality. I'm not trying to write a textbook of political science. I'm not presuming, as uh, Hamid Bhai said, I'm not presuming to offer the definitive answers to the issues this book attempts to raise. But the battle of belonging seeks to offer one person's notes towards an understanding of nationalism in the world, and specifically in India today. Um, our own, our own uh, uh, nationalism as anchored in our constitution and the conflict over contemporary attempts to convert it into something else today. If it provokes further debate and reflection on these very, very important questions, then the battle of belonging will have served its purpose. Thank you all once again for listening and Jai Hind. Thank you so very much, Dr. Tharoor, for sharing and for really explaining us the true meaning of certain terms. I'm sure the audience here are waiting to get their copies. All of you can order your copy from Amazon and start reading this wonderful book. Shashi, I've got your book in my hand and hopefully the audience can see it. And I noticed that on the back cover, it asks the question, are some Indians more Indian than others? And this book, in a very credible sense, is an answer to that question. But what I want to ask you is this. What put that question into your head? And why is it an important question to answer? Karan, I've partly answered that in the remarks I've just concluded before you joined, which is essentially that I was troubled by recent developments in our politics that appear to be reducing our inclusive nationalism into something, um, shall we say, uh, more exclusionary and anchored in a notion of identity uh, that the Hindutva movement is promoting. So I felt it was necessary to take to step back from these political conflicts and look at the larger issues of nationalism and see whether indeed uh, and, and, and capacious, capacious all-inclusive Indian nationalism exists, whether it's under threat and whether something else can be a viable alternative to it. I should mention, Karan, that the others have not yet spoken. So I've already, uh, uh, Dr. Ansari made a wonderful remark uh, speech opening the book. David Davida spoke briefly. I've introduced the book. And now we really do invite you to turn to the others, uh, Dr. Farooq Abdullah, Pavan Varma, and Professor Paranjpe, to also chip in before I, before I rejoin uh, your interrogation. It was purely out of politeness, dear Shashi, that I asked you the first question. Please don't worry. I'm happy not to ask you any more. I missed everything that's happened up till now because your wonderful publishers kept sending me a link that wouldn't open. But at last, we've got over that obstacle. So let me proceed. Dr. Abdullah, there is a view that those who support the BJP or its ideology of Hindutva consider themselves more truly Indian than people who oppose the BJP and oppose Hindutva. As someone who's an opponent of the BJP and an opponent of Hindutva, how do you respond to this view? Karan, I'd like to first greet all of those who are on the panel and then say, Mazhab nahi sikhata, aapas me bair rakhna, Hindi hai hum batan hai, Hindostan hamara. I have grown in British India and lived in what I would call free India, democratic India, India for all. When we had the opportunity of joining Pakistan in 47, it was my father and the others who felt that two nation theory is not for us. Hindus and Muslims are not different, or Sikhs and Christians. We're all human beings. And thus, we chose Gandhi's India, Nehru's India, mm -hmm. India that belonged to all of us, every one of us. Whatever your language, your region, your religion, your beliefs, it was for all. 
That's how I felt till this government came in. They think that only Hindu can be an Indian and all the others who are there cannot be Indians. They're second class citizens. This I'm never going to accept to my dying day. I believe this is for all of us. This is our motherland. We grew in it. We have educated in it. We have developed in it. Our families are here. Our ancestors are buried here. This is as good for me as a Hindu. I remember once in a school, I was studying in 10th class and I went to a Hindu home. The friend invited me to a meal and a Brahman Hindu. When I entered that, their space where they cook is supposed to be center of centorum. And when the mother got this food out, she put the chalky inside for the sun and for me outside. I immediately jumped in. She said, Trahi Bhagwanta, what have you done? I said, mom, tell me, how is he different? Has he not the same eyes? Has he not the same hands? Is he not the same as I am? What is the difference? You believe in praying this side. I believe in this side. But we are human beings. We have the same place, the heart, the lungs, everything. How is the difference? Mother accepted it and said, I was wrong. Today, we are being divided. Divided on religion, on caste, on creed, on language. Are we making a strong India? Shashi has done a great job writing this book. Yes, but how many of us will read this book? How many of us are going to get out of the propaganda that is being spread today in every place, in every inch to divide us? Is this going to make the difference? But I must tell you one thing. Tyrants come and tyrants go. Nations continue to survive. And I am confident this nation will survive. These dividers will go. For whatever one may be. As a doctor, I'll tell you one instance. When you go into the hospital and you need blood transfusion, does the man ask that is this blood that you're pouring into me of a Brahmin Hindu, of a Dalit Hindu, of a Muslim or a Sikh or a Buddhist or a Christian? Does he ask this? No. He gets better and he says, I want another bottle, please. What are we doing? We are trying to kill the very essence of India. I wish Gandhi would be alive and Nehru would be alive to see this India that they and millions fought, died in Kalapani and God knows how many places. They didn't think in 19, 1857 that you're a Hindu, you're a Muslim, you're a Sikh. They fought against the tyrants, the British, unitedly. They fought against the British all the time. Did they think at that time that I'm a Hindu, therefore I can't be like this? I'm a Muslim, I can't be like this? No, the goal was nation. Nation, nation for all of us, equal. You may be majority, you may be minority, but you are all one. It is that what keeps us going. I have nothing in common with a man who lives in Tamil Nadu or Shashi's Kerala. He has nothing in common with me. Our food, our tongue, the language we speak, the clothes we wear, the, the temperatures we face and the temperatures they face. But what unites us? That is the question. Our thinking that we can live only together and only together we'll advance. Together our future will grow and our nation will become stronger and stronger. Not stronger because we have an army, navy or air force. Stronger because we are human and we believe 
that humanity has to survive and that is how we have to grow. Shashi, unless we do that, look at parliament today. You can't ask questions. You can't get answers. Where is that debate? That was the essence of the parliament, of our constitution. Where is that gone? I remember when I first went to parliament in 80 and I looked at where Nehru used to sit. And I used to say to myself, how privileged I am that I am in this house to build not Kashmir, but to build India. Because with India, I'll grow. With India, I will live. Is this that India? Is this Gandhi's India? Is this Nehru's India? Is this Azad's India? What are we doing? How, how are you different? Just because you pray to a different way of God, is that different? We still love our motherland. To us, this is important. And without this, we cannot survive. And that is what we have to build. We have to fight against those forces that divide us, that divide us on religion, on caste and creed and language. And we will fight. Okay. And after us will fight. And we will build that nation for which it was made free from the British. And inshallah, we will succeed. Dr. So, Faransbe, in contrast to what you've heard from Dr. Abdullah a moment ago, there is a view that comes out strongly in Shashi's book and also in Shashi's interviews about his book that A, the BJP defines itself in the belief that true Indians are Hindus, the others are not true in that sense. They don't belong, they aren't intrinsically of this country. But there's a further point he also makes in his book that the BJP as a result has started to contest the idea of India that emerged out of the independence struggle and that got crystallized over the first 70 years of independence. Do you accept this view of the BJP that it doesn't accept non-Hindus as true Indians and that it wants to change the idea of India that we've all grown up with and accepted as the right one? Uh, thank you, Karan. It's wonderful to be on this distinguished panel. And the previous speakers have been very eloquent. I've been very moved listening to them. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about the book, you know, because I'm not a politician professionally or otherwise. And I must say, I can't claim to speak uh, on behalf of the BJP to either defend or oppose what they say. But respecting your question, I'll take up the latter part of it. I agree that the uh, uh, idea of India is highly contested today. And the Nehruvian consensus with which many of us grew up is now probably crumbled to dust. But if, I, if you give me just two minutes I, or one minute, I want to talk a little bit about the book because as a fellow writer, as a reader of books, as someone who loves books, loves ideas, I want to acknowledge what makes this book special, if you, if you permit. Of course, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. So first of all, Shashi, this is one of your best books. It's passionate, it's moving. And uh, if uh, others are listening in, I would say, you know, start with the prologue. It's a wonderful introduction to the book. And it talks about this problem of belonging, you know, someone born in London who, for all practical purposes, could have got uh, British uh, nationality or at least a passport and avoided long lines and lots of fees, who passionately refuses and remains an Indian, as he calls himself a congenitally, you know, proud Indian, and then takes up cudgels on behalf of refugees and you know it really problematizes this whole question of belonging i loved your story about uh, uh, this man uh, your colleague in chapter four the prism of identity umar bakhet you know who's displaced from eritrea becomes a swiss citizen is fluent in swiss and then agrees to meet a fellow uh, not swiss swedish, swedish. Swedish, swedish, sorry swede and agrees to meet him beneath the clock. And this very white Swedish guy passes him by for 15 minutes without asking 
was it you I was supposed to meet? And, uh, and really the question is, who is a Swede? Who is a Briton? Who is an Indian? And I completely agree with you and uh, Farooq Saab and uh, you know, Dr. Ahmed Ansari. Nobody can say they're more Indian than others. And certainly as a Hindu, I, I'd certainly not support anybody who says I'm more Hindu than you, you know, for this reason or that reason. I think that Orwellian uh, phrase is itself meant to question you know, such hierarchies. But if you permit, I want to, uh, you know, I want to argue with you, Shashi, if you don't mind, you know, and I want to now jump to your epilogue just for a minute. And then you say on page 405, this book has been a pain to an India where it does not matter what religion you practice, what language you speak, what caste you were born into, what color your skin is, and the celebration of a civic nationalism that affirms, etc. Now, what India are you talking about, Shashi? I mean, I was born in this country, and there's never a part of India where it doesn't matter where you were born, what your religion is, what your language is, what community you belong to. And I was forced on to, to, to confront this in a variety of ways. I was born in Gujarat. I was fluent in Gujarati. I still am. But I was never accepted as a Gujarati. I was always... Uh, told that, look, you, you were born in Gujarat, but you're a Maharashtrian, okay? And I've never lived in Maharashtra, okay? And then I grew up in Bangalore. I went to Bishop Cotton School there. And, you know, one day, as is the tradition in my family, I was, you know, put through this Upanayanam ceremony about which I knew nothing. I came to school and we stripped down for PT in our, you know, vests. And our PT teacher, Mr. Brown, he saw my my, you know, punal or upanayanam, the sacred thread. And I was berated. They said, who are you? Why you got this thread? And I said, I'm going to run and jump and do whatever you want me to. And I was racked so much that my dad said, listen, don't bother, take it off, you know, because it's really inside you, whatever, blah, blah. Then I came to St. Stephen's and I'm sorry to say, Shashi, I stood for president too, but I lost by 26 votes, unlike you. I don't <laughs> have your charm. And I don't have your diplomacy, uh, among other things. But, uh, you know, you were a legend for us. You and Chandan Mitra, etc., won that uh, uh, election. But listen, what I'm trying to say is, believe it or not, there were groups of people who were supporting me because supposedly I was a Brahmin and the other guy was a Rajput. It was a madhouse. You know, this was supposed to be a very cosmopolitan college where it didn't matter where you were from. Pavan is also a Stephanian. He can give you his experiences. And of course, after that, I spent several years abroad. I was in the US like you. And in no part of the world does your skin color not matter, your religion not matter, where you're from not matter. So this is a fantasy, Shashi, I'm afraid. And I'll say one more thing, then I'll come back to your question, Karan, if you permit me, which is, I, I don't think India is, is, this, you know, is, a, is a country which practices civic nationalism. I don't think so, nor is it a country of ethnic nationalism. As you know better than me, the origins of civic nationalism go back, you know, to the French uh, declaration, uh, you know, of, uh, of the rights of man and the US, uh, you know, declaration of independence. I think our model is different and we are not an ethnic nationalist state either. I think ours is a civilizational nationalism and all, always plural. Now, the last point I want to make coming back to Karan is that, you know, the people I know on the other side, that is, in, you know, the BJP side, the Hindutva side, the RSS side, and I know a lot of them, I talk to them, they tell me it's, it's your lot, it's the Congresses and others who have been dividing India with fake secularism, you know, fake socialism, fake equality, because, you know, there are so many hoops and loops and if you look at the, uh, you know, merit lists of any university, or even when you want to hire somebody, it's a madhouse. Vivekananda coming to Kerala said, this is a lunatic asylum. When I sit on selection committees, I think it's a lunatic asylum. You know, there's a general list, there's an OBC list, there's an SC list, there's an ST list, there's a PH list. There's a, you know, what all kinds of lists, backward points, forward points. What kind of civic nationalism is it? Where is the social contract? So I think we are a completely different kettle of fish. 
And frankly, the last thing I wanted to say, you know, with due respect to, uh, you know, Dr. Farooq Abdullah, you know, you can't exclude the millions of people who have voted, you know, for the BJP who support, uh, you know, Modi uh, and others. You can't say that, look, these people are people of inferior or unripe cognition. We know the right idea of India. They are deeply mistaken. And we are a small elite, you know, rooted cosmopolitans. We will teach you, you know, what the right idea of India is. So I'll conclude, uh, Karan, by coming back to your question. I absolutely agree that the idea of India is highly and hotly contested today. You know, and I think if you ask me, I think there are many ideas of India. And if, if Shashi stands for a plural and open, you know, idea of India, then it shouldn't delegitimate something which has a lot of support. We can certainly critique it, but I don't think either Hindutva nationalism or the idea of India, of BJP, which includes cultural nationalism, I completely agree, can be delegitimated, can be branded as either inauthentic, false, and then simply dismissed out of hand. I don't think that will do. What we need, and why I like your book, and I go back to what David is saying, and by the way, I want to congratulate you, David. You've not lost it, you know. I think, I think you're one of our best publishers. More power to you, more power to Aleph. But I, what I like about your book, Shashi, is I hope it's going to open up serious debates and people from both sides can really engage with your book. It's very well researched, beautifully written. And once again, thank you, Karan, for this opportunity. Thank you. Avan, let's concentrate for a bit on that central thought of an idea for India. Shashi believes that the idea of India that we inherited from the independence struggle that was crystallized during the first 70 years of independence is immutable. But I want to ask you, is the idea of India really immutable? After all, the idea of America enshrined in the American constitution of 1789 is very different to the country America is today. Surely, similarly, the idea of India can evolve, it can change with time. Or do you disagree with that? Thank you, Karan. And let me join the others, Shashi, in congratulating you. I've been a reader of many of your books, and I think this is a very important one, the cerebral energy you have invested in propagating and projecting a point of view which I think is very relevant today. And so I want to congratulate you and David. If I may say so, the, some of the issues you have raised are very central to the reality as we see it. I will come to Karan's question about the idea of India just after this. Because I think uh, Hindu extremism and its sense of exclusion is antithetical to our notion as a modern republic. Quite apart from the fact that much of this bigotry is rooted in ignorance of Hinduism, which we also need to correct. And if Hinduism itself is understood for some of the principles that are its essence, then we will not see such a conflict necessarily between what the constitution guarantees and what some of our civilizational legacy is. But having said that, all religious extremes are bad, including Islamic fundamentalism, which I notice you don't speak about in your book at all. And if there are sanctuaries for it in any parts of India, I think they should be equally the focus of your attack so that the book does not appear to be in this respect in any sense one-sided. Although I appreciate your belief that perhaps one is the bigger problem because it's in power, it's got a bigger political backing, it consists of the majority, etc. But I think that even-handedness should remain in our minds into for those who want to fight uh, religious extremism. Secondly, 
I really cannot understand what is civic nationalism. For a country which goes back to the dawn of time, and whose civilizational legacy is, is something we find it very difficult to ignore, even though it may not be blemishless, and which has certainly contributed that to any idea of India that we may have more recently formed. What is this sanitized notion called civic nationalism, which privileges a recent constitution as it should be, but posits it against any unwarranted cultural inf infusions as though that was the intent of our constitution makers. I don't believe it was. If, for instance, and I say this often, when you've written on Hinduism, I have written on Hinduism. If in the Upanishads, they say, Ekam Satya Bipraha Bahuda Vadanti. The truth is one, wise people call it by different names. If they say, Udara Charitanam Vasudev Kutumbukam, Ano Bhadra Kritavo Yantu Vishwata, let good thoughts flow to me on all directions. And if even some of this thinking, as part of our overall civilizational legacy, has contributed for our constitution makers to what the idea of India should be. Why do we need to devise a term called civic nationalism? As though countries' nationalisms are necessarily the drafting of a constitution and nothing to do, especially with, with the cultural legacy, especially for countries which have been civilizations for as many as uh, uh, 5,000 years. I, I really, I, I can speak to you separately also on this, but I don't think we should make that contrast. Secondly, this differentiation between nationalism and patriotism, Shashi, and I see it entirely why you make it, and I understand the context, because the use of nationalism or even of patriotism, where it becomes a weapon to literally test how much patriotism you are capable of, as against the monopoly that I hold, is wrong. But essentially, the difference between nationalism and patriotism, to my mind, unless they become distortions, is an intellectual quibble. Patriotism and nationalism, if they don't become xenophobia and chauvinism, are two sides of the same coin. Countries are proud of the fact that they have patriots and a sense of nationalism. So I believe that to make that distinction between the two, notwithstanding what Tagore, Rabindna Tagore wrote, I think it's something that we can debate and discuss, but I certainly don't necessarily make that distinction. Thirdly, I think that uh, there has been a tendon reason why the idea of India is being contested today, not entirely rightly, but certainly not without relevance. I will give you two quick examples. There is a feeling, for instance, that if you go back to the foundational years of our civilization, ancient India. And I can quote to you some reflex secularists who react in this manner. If you go back to study it, to understand it, not necessarily to eulogize it, you are an instrument of Hindu revivalism. And, and it has become part of the established uh, diktat of secularism that history also must be interpreted in certain categories in order into, to fit into the definition of acceptable secularism as some people see it. I believe that's wrong. And it has created some of its own backlash. Similarly, one of the contributing causes, perhaps, 
which I don't justify, for extremism in Hindus reacting, which I condemn, has been the selective implementation of the practice of secularism, not the concept which I entirely agree with, call it by any name, respect for all faiths. But there has been in the name of secularism, the distortion of secularism, which I believe mm -hmm. even though it had at one time the backing of the establishment, and now that establishment is out of power is being questioned and we need to have that debate. I've written about it extensively in my most recent column in the Times of India, which mentioned your book as a very important contribution to carry this debate forward with substance, uh, argues it. But there are many people today who are taking elements of what constitutes that idea of India and examining them again. Why did Mahatma Gandhi support the Khilafat movement? It's a question people ask. For a long time, they didn't because Mahatma Gandhi's intentions were always good. But we need to see what its consequences were. Why did, for instance, Jawaharlal Nehru, for whom you have a lot of respect, and so do I. In fact, his picture is behind me on television. Whenever, whenever I come on television, why did he write to Dr. Rajin Prasad that do not go for the inauguration of the renovated Somnath temple, which was destroyed with some degree of brutal vigor, as was much of the civilization that preceded the coming of Turkic foreign invaders. We are not excavating the past for creating present-day acrimony. That is the past. But if there are people who ask why Jawaharlal Nehru said in the pursuit of secularism, for Dr. Rajendra Prasad not to go for this, we have a reason to ask, which I also believe should be discussed when we speak of belonging. Because I don't believe that if he went for that function, he would cease to be secular. Respect for all faiths is what we have learned from Mahatma Gandhi's example, is not in contradiction with being immersed in faiths and respecting all of them genuinely. Not a withdrawal from religion, but an immersion, if necessarily, as Mahatma Gandhi did, into spirituality in order to derive the inference that respect for all faiths. So why did that happen? Then again, for the pursuit of secularism, why was the personal law of the Hindus changed and why was it not done for other communities? Now, for a long time, these questions, which are uncomfortable, were never raised. And so the idea of India remained uncontested. They are being raised now. We need to answer them in order to tackle those who are questioning them in deleterious ways, in harmful ways, in injurious ways, for political ends, in order to destroy the unity of India as a republic. But people must answer these questions. Why was the Shah Banu case judgment overruled by an ordinary. These are questions you are familiar with. We all face them in our life. To what extent has secularism become the appeasement of minorities for vote bank politics as against genuinely doing more for the minorities? And how much has, for instance, for whatever we accuse the BJP, which is uh, extremist elements among the uh, right wing. What has been the complicity of secular parties in this kind of politics? In a country which is so predominantly, overwhelmingly, numerically Hindu, if the Ram Temple is built finally after a Supreme Court judgment, I'm not saying that the judgment is right or wrong, whether it should have happened or not happened. I condemn the demolition of Babri Masjid. But in the birthplace of Ram, which Hindus believe in, uh, because religion is also a matter of faith, finally a temple is to be constructed on the basis of a Supreme Court judgment. Why do I hear then some secularists saying that it is the death of secular? 
Now, these questions are uncomfortable, but they are part of the contested framework of the idea of India, which we must take on board. So I believe that your book is an exceptionally important contribution to carry this debate forward. And while I respect the passion with which you argued and agree with most of your ideas, we need to take this debate forward. The best way to, con to, 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 to confront extremism is to be able to deal with it in a manner which is not derisory which okay. does not dismiss it, but which takes it head on and is able to argue with it, not on selectivity of facts, but with reason and introspection. I want very much to pursue the thought that Pavan raised about secularism versus patriotism, because it's a very important thread that runs through Shashi's book, like a leitmotif, literally from beginning to end. But before I do that, I want to pick up on something that Professor Paranjpe said and ask Shashi for a very brief answer. And in fact, at this point, I'll ask everyone to please make their answers brief because otherwise we're not even going to be able to manage a second round. We'll be hitting 8.30 very soon. Shashi, Professor Paranjpe said that there are multiple ideas of India. They contend as they should in any democracy because they reflect different people's different visions of what they believe their country should be. How then can you say there is only one correct idea of India and it's immutable? Surely democrac democracies require recognition of the fact that different people will perceive their countries in different ways and they must contend with each other as opposed to laying down there's only one idea that is correct and it's immutable. No, I think the answer is very simple, Karan, that I'm saying that this is the idea enshrined in the Constitution. We do know that many of the intellectual forebears of the present ruling party uh, disagreed with the Constitution at the time it was adopted, and they went on at some length. Uh, in fact, that um, the Constitution was fundamentally flawed because of its precisely being anchored in civic nationalism rather than in um, the Hindu Rashtra that they believed was the proper understanding of India. Okay, so what's happened is that a particular idea is in the constitution. Those who are entrusted and who've been sworn to office are on the basis of that constitution are now in the process of upending its, um, upending its very assumptions. And that's precisely my concern. If I could take the opportunity very briefly to react, uh, because you know, um, Professor Paranjpe also made the larger point that the whole idea of civic nationalism is uh, anchored in Western ideas. And that is indeed a, a well-known critique going back to, to Savakar, Golwalkar, and Dindya Alupadhyay, I just want to say that um, uh, essentially, just as the US Declaration of Independence and the French uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man, which Makaran uh, cited, inaugurated civic nationalism in those countries, so too did our constitution inaugurate civic nationalism in ours. It basically said it didn't matter whether you were Hindu or not, what caste you were, what language you spoke, which part of the country you lived in, what color your skin was. <clears throat> if you subscribed to the ideals of the constitution and the Indian state, you were Indian and you had equal rights as everyone else, including the right to persuade others uh, to change their religion, for example, uh, which is something which is very much in the constitution. Now, there are people who don't like those provisions. They don't like freedom of religion or particularly freedom to propagate and convert and so on. We're seeing a pushback against all of that. But as a description of what we have today, since the constitution established it as a, as, a, as, a, as a nationalism of institutions, practices and processes that everyone can equally subscribe to, that is civic nationalism. That's why okay. that also comes back to Pavan's question as to why I've used that Shashi, term. Shashi, Shashi, don't answer everyone because we can't no. have a discussion. That let, was the let, only question. Let me bring in your guests because they are waiting. Dr. Abdullah, let's move on beyond the questioning of an idea of India to the issue that Pavan Varma raised about nationalism versus patriotism. As I said, this is a thread that runs right through Shashi's book and it's crystal clear that Shashi approves of patriotism. He's very suspicious of, if not outrightly critical of nationalism. Do you believe like Shashi does that patriotism is the preferable emotion, the preferable sentiment? I think both are important. 
nationalism and patriotism. I think you cannot be patriotic and not be nationalist. And therefore, I agree with Pavan, what he said about it. And I think it is very important that we remember that while we think we are Indians, that gives us a, you know, a sort of a position in the world. We are not represented by anything else. Whenever we go, like Shashi said himself, of that, and the professor said, of that man standing in the clock, waiting for the guest that had to come. He thought he should be white, but he turned out to be not white, yet he was Swedish. The same way we, I feel that whereas you think of nationalism, separate to patriotism, I think you cannot separate them. You're a nationalist and you're a patriot. You're both. You cannot be one and not be the other. That's how I feel about it. This is a page Shashi writes, and I'm going to quote Shashi, to the nationalist, his government is beyond questioning. It's always right. Patriots, he says, harbor no such illusions. Do you agree with that assumption that a nationalist will never criticize his government? That patriots, however, have no compunction doing so. Do you accept that distinction between the two, or do you think this is a construct that is one created by Shashi himself? No, I think Shashi has, has definitely put the thing in, in his ways, but my own belief is that a nationalist can also criticize the government where they are wrong. That is, if he's a civic nationalist, he can. It's a mist for me. I'm a nationalist, but I criticize them where they're wrong. And I'm at the same time patriotic. I am part of this nation. And nobody can deny me that right. And thus, one thing is absolutely right. Shashi has his, I mean, this book, when I read, it confused me. You wouldn't believe. For I couldn't sleep that night as I was reading this first time. And I said, God Almighty, what research he has done. But it has, you know, fundamentally divided nationalism as separate and patriotism as separate. And for me, I don't think so. Okay. I can criticize the government and that is how it will be. Dr. Paranjbe, which are you? Are you a nationalist? Are you a patriot? Or does that depend upon the circumstances? Does it depend upon the context? And do you, like Dr. Abdullah, see no real opposition between the two, you don't recognize the distinction Shashi makes. Or do you agree with Shashi? Unmute yourself. Dr. Paranjme, have we lost you? No, unmute yourself. Who? Me? You unmute. No, yeah, I needed to unmute myself. I didn't want to disturb the others. No, I, I should I say, do not endorse the distinction, though I recognize it theoretically. You know, if you want to, you know, put me, you know, in the dock and ask me, I call myself a Swarajist, you know, and I think that what that means is that the people should be empowered and not politicians and the state. That's my position. You can call it a liberal position if you like, or you can call it a position deriving from Indic and indigenous thinking. But I just want to say one thing, uh, Mr. Thapa, to what you said earlier. You know, uh, Shashi, if I may say so, you've considered the Indian constitution almost like a sacred text which can't be changed. I think Karan used the word immutable, but the constitution has been amended 103 times, if I'm not mistaken. And how it. about the 42nd amendment? Which... Ah, we've lost Dr. Paranjve. But let me add to what he was saying, I assume that would have been a point he'd have made had he stayed with us, that in fact the very first amendment of the Constitution, as argued in a brilliant recently published book by Tripur Daman Singh, actually almost changed the very character of the Constitution. It demolished the freedom of speech and expression that we believe was guaranteed. And more importantly, it did it because a temporary parliament, not an elected parliament, and a one-house parliament, not a two-house parliament, 
chose to interpret its powers in such a way to amend the constitution. So this attitude to the constitution, which should be sacred, of being able to abbreviate it as you think fit for your political purposes, has a history that goes right back to Nehru in 1950. We've got Professor Paranjpe back. Go ahead, Professor Paranjpe. Precisely. That's exactly what I was saying. We were a sovereign democratic republic, and by the 42nd Amendment, pushed through during the emergency, we suddenly became a socialist secular in addition to being a sovereign democratic republic. Tell me, who believes in common property? We believe in individual property. We are not socialists by any stretch of the imagination. So we are living a lie. We are living a hypocrisy. And similarly, let's not kid ourselves. All our politics is based on caste calculations, linguistic, you know, calculus and religion and caste, and with due respect to Farooq Abdullah Saab, I mean, if you're all equal, why can't I buy a piece of land in Srinagar, which is one of the most beautiful parts of India? For that matter, I can't even buy it in Himachal. I can buy an apartment, but I can't buy a piece of land, etc. So let's not kid ourselves. I think there is a carapace that we like to uphold or uh, hold up to the world, but our daily realities in India are far more complicated. Okay. You know? Uh, we, are, we, are, we are living in a state of constant, I don't want to call it duplicity, but we live in two different worlds, you know, uh, like hati ke daat hote hain, dikhane ke aur chabane ke. Okay, so that's not, beautiful. Let's not make, yeah, I just want to say, let's not, let's not virtue signal. The last thing I want to say about Shashi is that he's against, you know, politicizing Hinduism to an extent, I agree, but he politicizes Hinduism in the opposite direction than the ruling party and says, look, mine is the authentic type. So he's still politicizing it only for the opposite reasons. Uh, Pavan, let's come back to that debate that you started that I want to pursue between nationalism and patriotism. Shashi's book makes it crystal clear that Shashi believes that patriotism is the more laudable of the two sentiments. He's actually critical of pat uh, nationalism. But, you know, over 245 years ago in 1775, long before nationalism had even been thought of, Samuel Johnson said that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. Isn't patriotism as capable and doesn't it lend itself as easily to being misused and abused by those who simply want to use it for their own nefarious purposes? And to that extent, you could be as critical of patriotism as Shashi is of nationalism. Well, that's the essential point I made. And I believe what we need to fight is the distortion of both nationalism and patriotism. That is essential. Because that leads, as I said, to its two concurrent consequences, xenophobia and chauvinism. Aggression and violence. Division in society. The need to see your pet, test your pet, patriotism as against mine. And to use nationalism to deflect the attention of people from the real problems and to stifle dissent and debate, which are essential traditions of, 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 of our civilizational legacy, which again Shashi tries to somehow bypass. And again, I come back to him. I spoke about the civilizational legacies of the past. But Ghalib, Farooq Saab said, hum muwahid hai, hamara kesh hai tarke rasoom, millate jab mit gai azai ma ho gai. Now, is this Sufi tradition part of the tradition that went into the making of our constitution, whose implicit and complicit, I mean, express injunction is respect for all faiths or not? When Thiruvalluvar wrote, So I just say that, you know, we must, in response to what is obviously extremism of any kind, we must never lose balance in jettisoning from our collective memory. Okay. So much that is valuable and which is contributing to the idea of India, which you lord. In this context, Dr. Abdullah, Let's come to that slogan that is both well known and now politically rather contentious, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. You once famously chanted it. I want to ask you a slightly different one. Is it 
unpatriotic to refuse to say Bharat Mata ki che, or does that give too much importance to a simple slogan? I think one of the things, Karan, that you should know, it should come from you. I mean, from person himself. It shouldn't be forced onto you. What they are trying to do, they are trying to force onto you. They're saying, you have to say it. And if you don't say it, another slogan they say about Ram. Now for God's sake, why are you wanting to thrust something which should emerge from you yourself? When you thrust something, everything has equal and opposite reaction. Newton's third law of motion. That's why I say, I say, it should emerge from you. That love should be there for this land, for your motherland. It has not to be forced. What they're trying to do is to force something. I don't disagree. This is a 80% uh, uh, Hindu land. But what was Ram saying? Gandhi always said Ram Raj. Ram Raj didn't mean that you will ignore the others. Did Ram say anywhere that he's going to ignore others? That they're not equal? So what are we trying to do? And I don't agree that constitution is like Quran, that it can't change. A change must be for better, not for worse. This is what I, my, my feeling is. There should be debate before you change something. There is no debate today. We are not able to even speak. Laws are made and with one voice, they're passed. For God's sake, have the patience of listening to others. Okay we can improve on something that you're doing. But there is no debate. Pawan is right. Unless you have a debate in a country, you can never improve this nation. Let me pick up on that thought about a debate, Professor Paranjpe, and illustrate the question I want to ask you by referring to something the Prime Minister said roughly a week ago when he was inaugurating the statue of Swami Vivekanand at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He said, and I think I'm quoting him correctly, national interest is more important than ideology. And then he added, we must not give more importance to ideology over national interest. Now, to my mind, that comes perilously close to suggesting that some ideologies are anti-national. Can that really be the case? Can some ways of thinking be anti-national? Or are they simply ways of thinking you disagree with, which is very different to being anti-national? Well, uh, can I just say that I heard that speech to an Oh dear, we've lost you again. We've lost you again. Shashi, briefly, will you step in and answer that question and hopefully... No, I, as I, 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 think, I think his answer would be more interesting because obviously you know where I come from. Let me answer, though, the, 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 the comments and criticisms very interestingly made by the three other speakers. No, 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 don't do that because you're disrupting the discussion because don't take it to a different subject altogether. I want to stick to this subject, so no. Don't well, answer I'll, I'll just say, I mean, my, the, my simple answer is that uh, nationalism and the national interest will emerge in a democracy from a contention of arguments and ideas within it, with some of which are based on ideology. And it's out of the clash of ideologies that a democracy chooses by which principles and which policies it wishes to be actually governed. So if you defining national interest, national interest is defined by the nationals of the country. And they will do it in a democracy through the processes, the institutions, the parliament, uh, and so on, that actually put the government in power to defend those interests. You cannot delegitimize those who disagree with you by saying that national interest is more important than ideology. That's putting a, a conclusion, as it were, ahead of the premises. The premises let are me, that we'll all contribute to ideological views. Let me put that point made by Shashi like this to you, Pavan Varma. I would say that one's ideology determines what you identify as national interest. 
And it follows that different ideologies will reflect upon and see national interest in different ways. However, the prime minister is actually saying virtually the opposite. He's saying that think, national uh, interest should determine what your ideology is. In other words, if your ideology is not in accordance with and does not further national interest, then it is an illegitimate ideology to have. Can, no. I, can I just jump in? I'm sorry, I must have lost my connection. But see, I've lived on that campus and I actually, technically, I'm still a JNU professor on deputation. But I can tell you there are extreme left ideologies which certainly do not believe in, uh, you know, a democratic nation such as India. They still believe in an armed overthrow and, and of seizing power, you know. And I think that, you know, if you have an ideology professed and declared in your manifestos, uh, which does not believe in the, should I say, legitimacy of an elected government. And uh, I, I don't think then that's one kind of ideology which I would certainly call anti-nationalist. But all others, no. I mean, once you accept that here's the framework, we elect our leaders. And I'll, okay. tell, you, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you the paradox that somebody who's one with, uh, you know, of 8,000 students in JNU technically, if you got 1,200 votes to win an election of the, you know, JNU Students Union, and then you say that uh, the prime minister is not legitimate because I've won with 800 votes, I think it's ridiculous. I think they're living in a balloon. They're living in okay. a fool's paradise. Very quickly, Pavan, you clearly heard Professor Paranjbe say that there are ideologies that he believes in his mind are anti-national, particularly the ones he defined as left-wing ideologies that don't even believe in democracy, that want to overthrow the state. Do you, and I'm repeating that question, agree with the Prime Minister that national interest must determine the ideology you espouse? Or do you accept what Shashi said, that whatever your ideology, it will determine how you see the national interest? No, let me say that the term anti-national is being bandied about today with an alacrity which is most disturbing. All our foundational texts are dialogues. The Upanishad is a dialogue. In Hinduism, I'm saying. The Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue. Finally, Krishna tells Arjun, look, this is what I think. Go ahead and do what you wish to. The Brahm Sutra is a dialogue. You put down the opponent's point of view before you come to any conclusion. We are a dialogic civilization and this whole tendency for the foot soldiers who are usually ignorant or certainly their aggression is in direct correspondence to their ignorance. Okay. They, they use anti-nationalism or sedition, or betraying national interest with a felicity which is most alarming. But I will say this for a nation. And again, I will go back to one of the concepts of dharma as it was in India, that there are many types of dharmic duties, but one of them is called apadharma. What you do in moments of total dire contingency or uh, crisis for a nation, a foreign invasion or a war where then temporarily you close the internal divisions temporarily okay. in order to face a common enemy. But that should not become an excuse or a pretense to permanently claim a monopoly on the dialogue and consider anyone else who disagrees to be anti-national. That is the that is the question, really. Okay. Before. We're going to have to end there. I'm afraid I've got a message from our publishers and organizers to say that we need to write off. And I want to therefore use this moment to thank everyone on the panel for a fascinating discussion. And I want to add one little note. Pavan says all our books, the Upanishads, the Gita, are dialogues. And the thought that occurred to me was, Thank God the Kama Sutra is not a dialogue. It is actually. Is it? <laughs> oh dear, how very sad. Interesting dialogue. Okay, but in the spirit of dialogue, one sentence from me, which is that 
every one of the very useful criticisms uh, and comments made by the other panelists, every one of them has been addressed in the book without exception, from the number of amendments to the constitution, to the distinctions between patriotism and everything else. And as far as civilization is concerned, uh, Pavan and Makranda have an entire chapter on Indic civilization. But my argument is, of course, that Indic civilization itself has evolved. It's not the pristine civilization of 3,000 years ago. So I just want to say all of this is there. Let's engage. My last remarks, uh, my last word when I introduced the book at the beginning was to say that if this book actually provokes some discussion and stimulates reflection on the ideas contained in it, it will have served its purpose. So I welcome some of the disagreement and debate. I think today's discussion proves that the book has served the purpose of Shashi, reflection on you're this. a brilliant politician who always interrupts to give his book a plug, and so you should. It's a book and that's literally worth reading. And let me add one more thing. If people want to see Shashi actually answer the issues raised by Dr. Abdullah Pavan and Makaran Paranjpe, then I recommend you watch an interview he did with me on The Wire. Just go to The Wire. It's over there. Shashi in particular talking about all the issues that we've raised today. And my thanks now to everyone for joining us this evening. Take care. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Karan Thapar. Uh, thank you so very much, all of you. Is India's notion of civic nationalism dead? Has nationalism been militarized? Our period Patriots and nationalists the same. I'm sure this book has raised many questions and forced us to wake up, act, and have serious debates now. I, on behalf of Prabhaketan Foundation and LF Book Company, thank our distinguished guests, Sri Hamid Ansari Sahab, Dr. Farooq Abdullah Sahab, Mr. Pavan Varmaji, Professor Makaran Paranjabeji, Mr. Karan Thapurji, Mr. David Davidarji, and of course the author, Dr. Shashi Tharoorji. I'd also like to thank our audience for your time and for being a part of this virtual book release event, Kitab. You can all order your copies today and enjoy reading this wonderful book. Kitab is an endeavor of Prabha Khetan Foundation to guide and push people towards book, thus making them more book-minded. Thank you so very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, Shishi. Thanks, Farooq. Thank you. Thank you. Your next book. Great. Thank you, Shishi. Thanks, Pavan. Thank you, Pavan. Thank you, Pavan. Thank you, Thank you.